way in which the Ten Commandments said of honoring God. We want to honor God through God's will. Are we able to find a way of honoring God in the will of God? And I think Ecclesiastes begins to show us another one of the nuances of God's will. How do we honor God? By fearing him. And what's the other thing? Keeping his commandments. This is what's known as God's moral will, which is God's revealed commands in the Bible that teach how a man ought to believe and live. Or, if you'd like that to be more alliterative, how to believe and how to behave. That one of the ways we know that we're honoring and pleasing God and doing what God wishes for us to do is to believe the things he tells us to believe in and trust in and to do and behave in the manner he tells us to behave and do in the manner of. That's one of the reasons why we study the Bible. It's one of the reasons why sermons are proclaimed and preached, why books are written, while there is a de desire for instruction from the Word of God to allow us to know that we're honoring and pleasing God by what we do. See, what we've learned is if you want to go back to Gabe's barn for a second, that first of all, Gabe can't decide to where to put the target because Gabe's not the one who created the archery board. In God's sovereign will, it's God's archery target that goes on the board. And then we can't just haphazardly decide where the target is. The bullseye, or what we're supposed to do, is described in the descriptive words of how God says he operates in a moral universe. His law not only describes how we should behave, but ultimately our, his law reveals who he is. Though we may not know all of his plans, we know the kind of God who's making plans. And we also know the kind of God that relates to us and the kind of life he wishes for us to relate to him and relate to one another. So one of the ways we discover God's will is by reading the Bible and doing what it tells us to do. In fact, the great example of understanding what God has written and living it out was... Where's Doug when I need someone to tell me who the great example is? For those of you who have been in a classroom setting with Doug Bacon, please help fill in his answer. Who is the great example? Jesus. John 6, we see Jesus describe himself as the one who knew how to live out what God had revealed. John 6, 38 said this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one of him who sent me. Jesus says, that's my whole purpose, to honor God by doing what God has told, has told me, asked me, commanded me to do. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, because I can trust that his plans include me, because that's what he's told me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. But then Jesus lives, leaves us with one of those moral commands of God, one of the things that we should believe. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have what? Eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. What is God's will for our eternal destiny? What does God want us to do to inherit eternal life? Wouldn't it be nice if he would reveal that to us? Wait, he did. The Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him, I will raise him up on the last day. The hope that we have is in the bread of life come down in John 6. The one who is pierced for our transgressions according to Roman, or Isaiah 53. Our hope comes in the one who said, if you will share in my death, you will share in my life. Put your hope in my death and resurrection, and you will receive it as well. And Jesus says, and here's the kind of guy I am. I'm not going to drive you away if you're willing to believe and look on me. So one of the ways we begin to discover God's will, and this is probably the one that we should spend the most time on, 
is living and believing as God wishes us to live and to believe. But God doesn't spell out all of life for us. So how do we make decisions? How do we begin to not only find meaning in God's will, not only do we ask how we find honoring in God's will, but how do we decide inside of God's will? And why is that important? Well, because the same John who wrote these words of Jesus wrote to his followers a few years later these words. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Which means the way we decide how to live is an indication of the fact that we've trusted in Jesus and we understand the way God has called us to believe and behave. And that's found within this greater area of God's sovereign will. This is God's plan as he has revealed to us. So how do you decide? And what decisions fall within God's will? This is where life gets fun. And this is where the counseling takes place, and the prayer requests take place, and the conversations take place. Let's go back to that barn for a minute. Now that there are many targets on the side of the barn, and it's time for you to go out and shoot your arrow, and you're told you have to hit a bullseye, which target do you choose? Which bullseye is yours? And how do you determine which bullseye is yours? The traditional view of discovering God's will doesn't just have God doing his sovereign action behind the scenes and God's teaching of a moral will, but it also has God's individual will for our lives. This is God's ideal, detailed life plan that is uniquely designed for each person. And you know what the struggle with that is? Is it a mystery to us or is it revealed to us? Did any of you come out with your instruction book telling you exactly how to make a decision on this date at this time and which way to make it? This is a mysterious will of God and this generally is what we talk about when we talk about discovering the will of God. Oh darn. I have to let three people make announcements and we're close to the end of our service time this morning. We may not be able to figure out what God's individual will for us is today. Let me reveal something to you, however. Next week, we're going to pick up on this topic. Does God have a detailed individual plan for every person and if so, then how does that affect decision making? Because if God has already predetermined and preplanned every step of your life that is his mysteriously secret plan, and the only way you can please God is by fulfilling his will, then it becomes very important that we make decisions that are within the individual will of God, not just the moral will of God or the sovereign will of God. The variety of targets in life, you got to figure out which target is yours and make sure you hit the center of the target. When you look out for a mate on this giant chasm of targets, you better make sure you're playing on the right archery card and make sure you get the right one, or else you have violated God's individual will for your life. And when you have options for jobs, you better make sure that you've got the right job that God had already predetermined, preplanned for your life. Which means we're going to have to figure out how to find this individual will and then how to live that out. Or we're going to have to ask a serious question. Is this even a biblical idea? And based on the looks Michelle Stout's giving me, I think she wants to know some answers. Which is why, in the great words of the great announcer back on the days of ABC, tune in again next week to the same bat channel at the same bat time.
But while we wonder about our individual will, when it does come to God's moral will, we know what has been said about God's divine plan of redemption. We know that Jesus has said, the hope that you have is to believe in the one that the Father sent, who fulfilled and was obedient to do his will, not his own, and who when he was raised up, if anyone would look upon him and believe in him, he will raise again on the last day. If today you want to make a confession of faith in that Jesus, sharing both spiritually and then in a physical form in the death and resurrection of Jesus in baptism, we offer you the invitation this morning as we sing.